Hello and welcome to another episode of Chatter, a podcast from The Gist, with me, Josh Hamilton. Nicholas Shaxon, the author of The Finance Curse, was my guest on today's show. I wanted to get in touch with Nicholas because I read his book about how finance could be as dangerous a thing for an economy as a resource such as oil or copper, where that prevailing industry ends up sucking money and talent out of the entire rest of the economy, much to the detriment of that country. Now, it is Nicholas's assertion that Britain has been a victim of the finance curse, and the financial sector in Britain has cost us a lot of money, talent, and ingenuity that might better have been spent in other industries. So we discuss all of these possibilities, as well as tax havens and the growing power of financial capital around the entire world. If you haven't already and you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast and to our mailing list. And don't forget my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, is now available for pre-order on Amazon. You'll find the link in the description below. So here's Nicholas Shaxon. Um, so Nicholas, it's an absolute pleasure to to be able to get you on the sh- on the on my show. I read your book and absolutely loved it. I mean, I was a bit depressed, but I loved it. <laughs> so why don't you give us um, like a little bit of an idea? So what is the finance curse? Okay, the the finance curse is about it's about financial centres. Uh, essentially, we all need finance. We all need you know, banks and banking and related things to save our money and, you know, small businesses want to borrow money and stuff like that. But finance is a service. And what happens is in some countries, the finance center grows too big. In the United Kingdom, we're talking about the city of London um, financial center. Um, And once it starts to grow too big, it starts to harm the country that hosts it. Um, now, this is uh, this is uh, different from tax havens. I, I basically have written my, my last two books. The first one was called Treasure Islands about tax havens. And the second one was about the finance curse. And, and, and the difference is a tax haven is a financial center in a country that kind of transmits harm outwards to other countries. So, uh, you know, the Cayman Islands, for example, it um, allows companies and rich people elsewhere to either cut their tax bills or achieve secrecy and commit crimes or, um, uh, you know, all sorts of other sort of possibilities that, that really are harmful for the world at large. So they transmit harm outwards. The finance curse is uh, describing a phenomenon where financial centers in, the, um, in a country transmit the harm inwards to the country that hosts it. So there's this kind of in the UK, for example, there's this very, very predominant narrative, which is very difficult to shake that most people kind of they haven't thought too hard about it. But there's a large number of people believe it is that London, the city of London, which is kind of the center of the financial industry in the UK, is the kind of um, the engine of the economy. It's the goose that lays the golden eggs. It's it's the you know, it's it's the source of wealth and jobs that showers kind of tax revenues and um, and other good things on the rest of the economy. And that's the predominant narrative. The, the, finance nar- the finance curse goes directly against that. And it says, OK, we do need a financial sector, but the city of London is too big and it is harming the UK overall. And if we had a smaller city of London with fewer jobs in the city um, and fewer tax revenues being raised from city of London financial institutions, Britain as a whole would be a more prosperous place. You would have better jobs. You would have a better off economy. People would be better off. So the sort of shortest version of the finance curse thesis is um, too much finance. Too much finance is bad for you, and for prosperity and well-being, shrink the financial sector. And there's a whole series of reasons for that. But yeah, carry on. So my the first question obviously has to be. Um, how did this become the the sort of prevailing wisdom r- roughly or sort of in your opinion anyway why 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 are so many people sort of accepting of this myth that the city of london is is a good thing for britain i think part of it is because it's such an easy narrative to say I mean, what they do is you know you have um you know there's organizations like the city uk which is a kind of lobbying organization for finance which puts out this this story that you know the city of london generates x many hundred thousand jobs and it pays this many you know billions in tax revenues and presents it as if that's the end of the story 
um, as if, uh, you know, we don't need to think any further about that. And the implication of this analysis, and it, it's something that it's sort of very intuitive. I mean, people can see people getting rich in the city and they think, well, you know, there's a lot of wealth being created there and some of it's going to shower, you know, c come our way and um, it's going to kind of, you know, spread out across the country. And if only we can uplift the rest of the country to sort of match the city of London, we'll be doing all right. And so we should aspire to that kind of thing. So it's kind of an aspirational view. It's a, it's it's something that you know you don't think too hard about it. Um, you you can easily believe it, and um, so it, it's very easy to get this message out there. And that combined, of course, with the 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 political power of the city of London in getting the right people in government, in making sure that the right people are in charge of powerful think tanks or media organizations or whatever. Um, and it's a very, it's not, you know, it's not a sort of single conspiracy or anything like that, but it's just like, you know, a, a large network interest of money constantly pushing in one direction to favor um, uh, the city of London financial center. And that's not just banks and banking, but it's all sorts of other um, bodies like hedge funds and private equity and even more esoteric things like the repo market that, is this trillion dollar, multi trillion dollar industry that nobody's ever heard of? Um, all sorts of things going on there, um, and all of them have tremendous power and um, uh, are able to sort of influence public opinion. It's a steady drip drip over years and years, over decades, that the city is the sort of indispensable. You know, the implication is that we shouldn't tax or regulate or anything the city too much, or it'll you know damage the, the golden eggs. I and mean, do you want to interrupt that with a question? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the the sort of the, the big thing is is this sort of competitiveness agenda that you really sort of um, you critique quite heavily in the book. It, how do you think that it's? Why do you think it's such a huge thing in in our modern economy? Do you think it's neoliberalism that just means that competitiveness and profitability are the single like things that we must focus on in order to have a prosperous economy it can't it can't be to do with you know like community good or perhaps something that isn't profitable but it brings you know um great things to to the country in other sort of less easily measurable metrics like why why is it that that competitiveness and profitability are are the the focus of of our economy is it is it just our our culture is it is the way that things have evolved or is there i don't know maybe something slightly more you know intangible yeah. there yeah so the, the competitiveness the word competitiveness is is a can of worms which needs quite a bit of unpacking and when i talk about in the book this thing called the competitiveness agenda what i mean is there's all this kind of mobile financial capital sloshing around the world, trillions and trillions of it, and countries around the world are trying to attract it. They're saying, if we can attract, just attract enough of this money that's sloshing around the world, we'll get rich. So that's the kind of competitiveness agenda. And if we tax and regulate it too much, it's all going to run away to Zurich or the Cayman Islands or Singapore or somewhere like that. Um, it, and, and so the competitiveness agenda is a kind of it's a sort of rather despairing analysis. You know, we can't put these democratic controls on capital, on finance, because it's all going to run away. <laughs> and um, it's also used, wielded as a threat. Um, and it has been used um, uh, by uh, Labour and Conservative politicians going back many years. They sometimes they put it in the language, they use the word competitiveness. You know, they say things like, we must have a competitive tax system. We must have a competitive financial regulatory regime which means that you know we're going to attract the right kind of um, you know all this hot money sloshing around the world and they use terms like open for business and and um various other terms which which are all about attracting financial capital and making sure that financial capital mobile capital doesn't get subjected to democratic restraints and part of it um you know i've done a lot of work on tax havens part of it comes in enforcement just enforcement of the law you can have competitive enforcement of the law. In other words, what you would do there is you say, OK, we're going to have these rules in place which look nice, but we're not just not going to enforce them. And, the, you know, um, subtly, we're going to put the message out to the world, you know, the people who own the money, um, you know, come to our country and break the rules and we're going to turn a blind eye. And uh, so there's all this kind of blind eye turning, this tax cutting, these creation of tax loopholes, um, uh, financial deregulation, all of it has been sort of 
put forward as like, this is the way we're going to get rich. And the finance curse analysis, and I'll get get to the, you know, why too much finance can make you poorer. But the finance curse analysis directly opposes this because what it says is, okay, if you attract money into your country, you're going to have, you've already got too much finance. Your financial sector is already too big and you are going to be poorer. So you attract, it's a kind of paradox. Money coming in, too much money, too much finance, wrong kind of finance coming in is going to damage your country. Um, and it's going to make you as a nation poorer. It's not only going to redistribute the pie unfairly from poorer sections of the country to richer sections. It's also going to shrink the pie. It's going to make Britain as a whole less prosperous. And so the finance curse says you, it's kind of like it's actually, even though it's got a sort of negative sounding name, it is a very, very optimistic message. Because it is, is it, it is saying those stories they were telling you where you can't tax or regulate too much because all the money will run away. Those stories are completely wrong. You can have both. You can put in place democratic controls. You can protect your country. You can raise the tax revenues from large multinationals and from banks and so on. And you can regulate them properly in the name of democracy, the environment. And you will also be richer for it. And that's the optimistic message. It's this sort of win-win message that breaks away from the kind of the old the long standing sort of neoliberal message that we've got to keep cutting taxes and deregulating. And so it's a kind of um, it's a very useful um, way of undoing the whole kind of what you might call the ideology ideology of neoliberalism, but what I would call the sort of finance ideology. And it's it, it's a very, you know, it, it basically is a way to reinvigorate democracy. Once people understand this message, they will see that we don't have to go down this, you know, tax cuts for the rich deregulate finance route, we can go in exactly the opposite direction and we'll all be better off for it. And there will be a few people, you know, rich people who won't be so well off. But, um, uh, you know, I think one of the greatest concerns of the world economy today is that there is too much inequality. And if the rich are a little bit poorer and everyone else is better off, then I think we're in a better place. So that's the kind of message. Um, and But the reason, you know, why is the finance curse... Why, why does too much finance make you poor? Well, there's several reasons for it. Um, the most important reason is what I would call extraction. So a lot of companies um, are, have become rather predatory. When you, you know, when you have a financial sector that sort of starts at a certain size, um, you know, the, the, the ideal size, it's providing the services you need. It's, it's you know, letting you deposit your money and, and letting you save your money safely. And it's letting you, um, you know, letting small businesses get their loans and, you know, just making the economy function. But once it starts, once it's sort of fulfilling all these roles, it's doing everything it's supposed to, then it keeps expanding. And that's what's happened in Britain. Um, and you could argue, argue that Britain's financial sector was kind of an optimal size sometime in the 1980s, um, if you look at the data. Um, and once it starts expanding beyond this optimal size, finance starts looking for opportunities in the real economy. And what it wants to do is to go in, go into the real economy, other parts of the economy from tourism to, to manufacturing, to agriculture, to electronics, um, you know, every, everywhere in the economy, finance will go in and sniff out sort of profits are being made here. What we're going to do is we're going to go in, we're going to buy up these companies, we the financiers, um, and, uh, you know, often it's private equity firms, but it may be other firms going in and buying up perfectly healthy companies that are doing just fine. And then say, what we're going to do now is we're going to financially engineer them. We're going to, you know, this, we're going to buy this company. And this company hasn't been running its tax affairs through tax havens enough. So we're going to do a fine. We're going to re-engineer it so that to escape the tax bill. Then we're going to um, say, OK, it's paying its workers too much. Its pensions are too generous. We're going to smash the unions. We're going to, um, you know, put all these policies in, in place uh, to um, cut our costs in that respect and get some more money out of them. And then we're going to maybe the customers are being treated too well. We're going to we're going to start, you know, taking action against the cut and taking legal action against the customers or whatever. It's something Donald Trump has a long history of doing in the US. Mm -hmm. And and so it, all these kind of different things are sort of extracting wealth from other stakeholders in that company, the taxpayers, the workers, the pensioners, um, the customers, you know, the suppliers as well. Um, and they will 
extract all this wealth and get rich. And none of this is making is any good for the actual other stakeholders for the for the rest of the economy but it is very good for the people who own the financial companies so they're extracting wealth they're sucking it sucking it out in a very unproductive and very damaging way because you know when you pay workers less you have all sorts of other knock-on effects um of you know can be things as awful as homelessness or crime or drug addiction or you know, there's endless kind of problems emerge that that um don't really get factored into the calculations. So you get other parts of the economy being extracted from. And then what they also do, once they've got this extra cash flow that they've extracted in this unproductive way, they then financially engineer that. They get a lot of debt in. They get the company that they bought to borrow a lot of money um, and then pay themselves from that borrowed money. And then now you've got a, a highly indebted company, um, which is more fragile. So you start getting risks of of um, companies going bankrupt. And we've seen quite a string of back bankruptcies recently. Um, even before COVID happened, there was quite a lot happening. And it was a lot of it was down to these complicated financial structures, sucking the wealth out, making leaving the companies more fragile, um, but making the owners very, very rich indeed. And so you have um, uh, people in London getting very rich indeed, but at the expense of other parts of the economy. So if you can reverse this, if you can stop these kind of games, these financial games, and there's plenty of fairly simple ways to do it, um, you can you can um, not only pump a lot of wealth back into the rest of the country, um, other parts of the economy, but also the regions. Um, money would be pumped out of London, out of the city, into the regions, and you'd have um, a rebalancing of the economy if you tackle the finance curse effectively. Um, you'd also have this kind of geographical re rebalancing where, where you know, people in the region start to do better than they were because they're not being extracted from so much. And um, taxpayers would, you know, the, the tax authorities would be much better off because, um, you know, these companies' financial affairs aren't being run through tax havens anymore. So all of this kind of de-financialization, this term financialization sort of describes the process of finance going into the rest of the economy. Definancialization would involve, you know, increasing taxes on multinationals, stopping tax, cracking down on tax havens, um, allowing unions to grow strong again, um, uh, and and in, in, in enacting all sorts of laws to kind of um, tackle the predatory aspects of finance and and shrink the city back down to a size where it's providing the services that we need and no more. So um, I'm going to roll two questions in the one here because you kind of touched on both of them. Um, so one of the things that really continues to strike me is sort of the the acceptance of of tax havens as as a as a thing. Just just as a uh, I I honestly um I'm baffled as to to why it's kind of accepted. Um, legally that this just kind of happens that, that it's fine that once you get to a certain level of wealth you can sort of just ship your money offshore and um, that's all fine you know doesn't matter we just um, we just kind of accept it and it's not like it's it's unknown to the public um, I'd say that the a good 50% of people on the street are aware that maybe more, I don't know what the figures are, I'm just speculating wildly, but that people are aware that the rich are, are taking their money and, and not playing the game that we all play. Um, like, why do you think that is both legal and accepted? Like, Why is there not more just rage at, at, at the fact that it's one rule for, for everyone else and another rule once you get to a certain level of wealth? And and that kind of ties into, like, is, is there... Is there really a way to control the, the, the flow of, of global capital? Is it is it too powerful now for us to really get a handle on? Or like do you actually like see a, a genuine way that we can constrain it in, in terms of its use of tax havens, the way it can sort of bounce around the world with no accountability and, and you know, is do we have a way back? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you're certainly not alone in that question. You know, why on earth, why the hell do we accept tax havens? Why are they allowed? Why don't we send in the gunboats and stop all this nonsense? <laughs> and that and many people have asked again and again and again. Um, th there's a couple of answers to that. Um, I think the, the one of my favorite quotes from an American tax expert called Lee Shepard, um, she, she answered this question by saying, um, the, you know, we, he, she described them as financial whorehouses. Um, and 
the, the reason we don't crack down them is because the town fathers are in there with their trousers around their ankles. And I think that kind of summarizes a lot of what's going on. So many of the people in power are um, deeply involved in the tax haven racket. They are, you know, you have sitting MPs in the UK who have been involved in setting up some of the biggest, you know, uh, tax, uh, biggest sort of uh, shell company operations in the in the Cayman Islands, for example, that kind of thing, and Belize, and, and there's, they're all steeped in it. There's, there's a, um, a, an offshore investigator um, called David Marchant who, who runs uh, an investigative outfit called Offshore Alert based out of Miami. They're one of the best-known investigative outfits in this whole area. And he said when he sees – when he's investigating a corporate structure, when he sees a lord or a sir or one of these kind of British appellations in a corporate structure, he treats it as a red flag. Um, in other words, the, you know, they call it, they, they talk about having a lord on the board. It, it, it's kind of a way of legitimizing what you're doing. You know, you put one of these fancy names on and people think, oh, this is all, all right and proper. But what this is really telling us is that the whole establishment has become deeply corrupted by this stuff. It, um, these people are, the tax haven world totally suffuses our political establishment, particularly in the UK, the Conservative Party, but the Labour Party is certainly not immune. Um, there is a whole, so, so there's a whole kind of political capture going on. The other part of the story um, is that who are the tax havens? And that, that's one of the big themes of my of my book, Treasure Islands. You know, I think most people, when I wrote it, you know, had the idea that it, tax havens are sort of small, exotic you know, probably Caribbean islands or Switzerland or whatever, just a few places, um, and they're kind of out of the way places. <laughs> but in fact, the world's biggest tax havens are, um, there's various different ways of measuring it, of course, but but it's fairly well accepted now. There's been a lot of, um, a lot of people have sort of woken up to this, that the biggest tax havens in the world are, of course, Switzerland is, is still a very big one. The United Kingdom itself, the UK is a tax haven. The United States is a very, very important tax haven. Um, and I won't get into the nitty gritty of, you know, how you define it and stuff like that. But basically, these are places that are playing this game very hard of attracting inflows um, and attracting inflows by by creating this offering to all this hot money sloshing around saying, we're going to give you an easy time. You bring your money to us and we won't tax it. We'll give you some loopholes. In the UK's case, it's very much about um, the UK runs this network of British tax havens around the world, um, the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, um, uh, Bermuda, um, overseas territories, and, and, and Jersey and Guernsey, the Isle of Man. These are all places that kind of feed this mobile, you know, they, they use these loopholes and stuff to attract the capital and they feed the kind of business, they feed this capital up to the city of London into the UK. So there's this, <coughs> the UK, <coughs> excuse me, the UK has taken on this strategy of attracting this money in the belief that it's going to make the UK richer and better off. Um, and I think, you know, the first piece of evidence that that's not the case is, is if you just look at the economic performance of the UK compared to, you know, I don't know, France or Germany. Um, I think in GDP per capita terms, you know, they're not too far apart. But in terms of inequality and social indicators, the UK is much worse off. And um, it's, you know, its economy is actually a lot more um, fragile than the German or French economies. Um, and productivity, UK productivity is very, very significantly below those those economies. So all this money coming in, it, it's been this sort of part of this national interest and this, this, you know, we must be a tax haven. The tax havens are not places elsewhere. It's us. We are the tax haven. And um, we think we're going to get rich by attracting all this dirty money. Um, uh, so we, you know, we, you know, even though we Brits generally don't like, you know, the idea of Africa being looted and, dirty money being sort of stashed in tax havens. And we don't like the idea that we could be harboring sort of criminal money from organized criminals in different countries. This idea that money is coming in and it might somehow benefit us makes it very hard for us to kind of create a coherent strategy and oppose this stuff because we're kind of conflicted. You know, we like the money, but we don't like Africa being looted. And what are we going to do about this? Well, we're not, you know, and it's, 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 it's a recipe for kind of, you know, but I think once you understand that, not only is this stuff looting Africa, but it is also hurting us. I think then you have a, pow a powerful um, message for political change. Um, and so I think that's where that's where we 
where we need to go. And I think, you know, to unblock this logjam of why can't we do anything about tax havens, we need to take on some sort of concept like the finance case and to understand how damaging it is for us at home in the tax haven in the UK that is receiving all this financial inflows. How did so? How did London become the the financial or the the, the you know the dirty money capital of the world? Uh, how how did how did we end up with that being the case as with London as that sort of center of the world? You talk a lot about the kind of the fact that in the book that that London led the the sort of global financial regulatory race to the bottom and was in a way sort of quite culpable for the the conditions that led to the two thousand eight crash. Like, uh, how, how did how did we end up uh, with London in that position? Well, London, um, it, it really goes back centuries, this thing. So it goes back to the days of the British Empire. Um, back in the days of the empire, London was, they called it the governor of the imperial engine. They, it was the kind of central turntable for the money coming, you know, in and out, you know, going around the empire, it would generally go through London. That's where all the sort of, bankers and financial people, insurers and financial people were. And it was the sort of central turntable. And it, you built up this whole kind of financial establishment in the UK that became, you know, the part of the dominant dominant political establishment in the UK. Then you had this period in the Second World War. Um, after the Second World War, you'd had both the Second World War and the global financial crisis, uh, the, 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 the crash of 29 and all that. Um, where you had the complete discrediting of the old financial order by that crisis and the crash and, you know, the recognition that finance was right at the heart of that economic crash. Then you had that crash leading to awful economic conditions um, uh, or contributing to awful economic conditions that led to, that created the conditions for war in countries around the world. And then you had the war itself. So, and, and the war itself created this incredible sort of political momentum for change. Like, we've got to do something about this. We're not going to take this aristocratic nonsense anymore. We, the working class, have shed our blood in the fields of France, and we are not going to stand for anything. And you also had, you know, it it was that the war was kind of equalizing in another way. There was um, one of the sort of leading UK politicians after the war, a guy called Lord Carrington, um, described how he used to sleep under his tank with his men, and um, he would... uh, you know, he realized that, that, you know, he had he was part of the total part of the aristocracy, but he sort of realized in these conditions that, you know, he described them as, you know, the finest people in the world. And, you know, we've got to do something with these people when we get back into power. And so there was, you know, this kind of spirit abroad, really kind of progressive spirit after the war, like we really got to do something. And so countries put in place this extraordinary set of policies, um, very progressive policies, the New Deal in the United States, very progressive policies in the UK, France, Germany, lots of different countries where you had very, very high tax rates on the rich. Um, the top marginal tax rate in the UK uh, for a period after the Second World War was 98%, would you believe it? Um, and you had very strong regulations, anti-monopoly regulations and rules, um, very strong in the United States. They were also brought in after the Second World War, partly in recognition that monopolies helped, helped bring the Nazis to power. Um, in Germany, and uh, very high, very high tax rates, anti-monopoly, and you also had this extraordinary international system of collaboration, which recognised that finance was dangerous. You know, there were uses for finance, but you had to keep it under control. And flows of finance across borders between countries were very, very carefully controlled under the under the so-called. Bretton Woods system. So you could, if you wanted to, you know, uh, sell a container of oranges to another country, you know, obviously finance needed to flow to pay for that. But if you wanted to speculate across borders, if you wanted to say, like, I I think I'm going to buy, you know, a bunch of German marks now because I think the marks are going to rise and you wouldn't be allowed to do that. You go to your central bank and say, I need, I need to buy some marks. And they'd say, no, what, you know, what's your justification? And they'd look at it. And if it wasn't a good justification, they'd say, no, you can't have it. And so finance was really bottled up. There was very f- strong financial regulations. The bankers were furious. The city was shrunk and um, profits were withering. Um, but this period of, finan- of what's called financial repression, strong financial repression, was the period of highest economic growth um, and most broad-based economic growth, sort of falling inequality, um, 
in world history before or since. That's that period, the sort of quarter century after the Second World War, when these progressive things were put in place, um, was that was an extremely prosperous time. It was kind of like the you know, you've never had it so good um, as a British Prime Minister said. Um, this was you know the sort of the, the, the golden age, and then after that you had finance began to sort of break free of its bonds and capture the politics again and started to slosh around the world and um, these sort of controls fell apart and there were ideological changes that kind of tax cuts and deregulation and so on and then you started to have falling economic growth and um, higher in rising inequality from about the 1970s um, it really was underway really in full throat by the sort of late 80s early 90s and um, you know lots more economic crises so you know we're kind of at the stage where where you know we're, i think we're probably in the sort of latish phase of the stage of people saying oh we've got to deregulate and cut taxes and everything like that and just let finance run free run and mock around the world world economy and nearly all countries now have um in the last you know three or four decades basically loosened all controls i mean the, the big exception is actually china china has still um uh, quite strong, has had for a long time quite strong controls of flows of finance across its borders, and you know China's been a very high growth economy. Um, so yeah, so it, it, it's a, it's a it's a long history, but I think we're now at a, at a change where we've had you know one large global financial crisis and a new crisis that we're now probably in the early stages of that are focusing people's minds, and I think there's a lot of new ideas out there, and we'll see where this goes. But I think the possibility of controlling finance again is very real. I think there's an awful lot that can be done. So do you envision, like how do you envision us as sort of combating um, the the rise of, of financialization? Do, do you see like another international sort of Bretton Woods style arrangement springing up? Do you see perhaps maybe individual countries taking the lead and, and sort of going forward with this first and becoming... I don't know what people would maybe call quite protectionist, like putting in capital controls or, or something like that. Um, or do you think Britain could be that that country to do it with with sort of Brexit and and COVID, meaning we're going to have to sort of rethink a lot of things? Where do you where do you see this going? Do you really think it's possible for us to 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 combat financialization? Yeah, I think it really is possible. Um, uh, there's a lot that can be done. I mean, obviously, you know, anything you try and do will be leaky and they'll try and get a, get around it. But um, two things, really. One is, you know, a lot of people generally say the answer to this stuff is international collaboration. If you, you know, if, you, if you've got tax havens and tax loopholes and stuff, then, you know, all countries have got to come together and agree not to do certain stuff. Um, and, you know, th there's a lot to be said for that. And I don't disagree that we should try and we should collaborate internationally. But the trouble is it's a bit like herding cats because... You know, if you say we've got to, no, everyone's got to stop all their X, Y, Z tax loophole and do something different, then <laughs> you'll get some countries saying, OK, well, we'll agree to that. But then actually we're going to cheat and we're going to put in a little thing that doesn't quite, you know, it's just sort of slightly outside that rule. But it's pretty much more of the same. And you've seen a lot of that happening. You So you do have a lot of initiatives going ahead now, um, which are very significantly the result of pushback from civil society. Um, in the tax area, there's some quite powerful things coming through. They're leaky, but we're, you know, we have to think about these things in kind of 10 year lifespans over the next 10, 15 years. Um, you know, what kind of changes are we pushing for? And the things that civil society, you know, the tax justice network that I've done a lot of work with has put forward some very radical proposals back in sort of the early 2000s when it was first founded. And everyone was saying that's utopian and never going to happen. Nobody's going to agree to this. And uh, there were sort of four main proposals um, that Tax Justice Network put put forward, and the sort of you know you you know you guys are utopian leftist crazy people, is what is the sort of general reaction. Mm -hmm. Now all four of those policies are mainstream um, OECD rich country policies, and um, to varying degrees. I mean, with you know lots still to fight for and lots of gaps and stuff, but they are all they are all in place. So. Change really does can and does happen. An organisation at the sort of um, grassroots le level, combined with you know knowledge and expertise, can can achieve an awful lot. But the other side of it is this kind of finance curse side, is that um, the you don't what the finance curse tells you is collaboration with other countries is great and important and necessary. 
where you can achieve it. But because it's so difficult to achieve, and it's also quite difficult to achieve, you know, what do you put on a street protesters poster? You know, let's collaborate internationally to achieve this. It, it's very difficult to sort of mobilize people. But the finance curse is different. It says you can do this stuff unilaterally. You can tax corporations a lot more. And that may chase away the predatory stuff, but you didn't want that stuff in the first place. And it'll leave you with the good stuff that's embedded in your economy, the stuff that you need. You can regulate your companies um, more effectively. You can improve financial regulation, reduce the risk in the system, and that will benefit your company, your country in the long run. You can do this unilaterally. It helps to have international cooperation, but you don't have to have it. You can lead. You can be a leader. Um, and I think that's where we're probably going to start going. Um on balance of probability, we're going to see Joe Biden in the White House. Um, he, I mean, I'm, will, I'm not, I'm not saying anything about that. It's far too, you know. I was, yeah, we'll <laughs> see, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Yeah. But um, you know, if he wins the White House, um, then you know, you will have a, sh a push away from this fight. You know, not, not, I don't know how far Biden would go, um, uh, a Biden administration would go, but. But you would see a push away from a lot of these things. And I think in the UK, even though you have a, you know, a very entrenched Conservative Party government in power, there's a lot going on behind the scenes and in civil society. So sort of society is changing and what society wants is changing. And I think, um, you know, we have got the potential for a lot of this stuff to be rolled back. How much do you think those attitudes in in society towards this thing will affect the, the, the you know, the governing party? I mean, we're we've seen like, there's a graph in america that i remember seeing um from some pew polling that basically suggested that there was almost zero correlation between what the public wanted and what actually happened in in congress um and the only way that you could sort of skew and like find correlation was between was when you sort of factored in what donors were pushing for and those were the that that was the only thing that that, that indicated where policy was going to go do you think we're we're in a position in the UK where perhaps that that change in in opinion can can push the the political parties who you you sort of readily admit are are quite captured by the sort of ideology of of financialization? Yeah, I think there's I mean I I think there's no need to be defeatist about it. It is obviously worrying situations, lots of worrying things going on in the world. Mm -hmm. But I think so a lot of people say, well, we had this great global financial crisis, um, you know, a bit more than 10 years ago, and nothing really changed after that. And that's kind of true. Um, we still had the same sort of basic financial consensus, um, ha you know, gripping our countries. But what's different now is, so when the global financial crisis hit, both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party in the UK basically were singing from the same hymn sheet, you know, this competitiveness, we must deregulate and treat the city with kid kid gloves and not enforce the criminal laws too hard we don't want to annoy the rich people and scare them away yeah um and and there were no other ideas really lying around then there was you know people were obviously you know there was obviously people saying things but they were just so far outside the mainstream that nobody was listening what we have now is there's a ton of ideas lying around now and a ton of ideas that have become really very um if not central mainstream, moving fast into the mainstream. And so we have a very different political calculation to be made. I mean, you know, when you have the chief eco economics co commentator of the Financial Times, Martin Wolf, um, uh, it was a couple of years ago, writing articles such as we must, with headlines like we must strip private banks of their power to create money. Um, we know that there is some radical thinking going on really among in the mainstream. And so I think now we have we have significantly shifted um, what's possible and what is um, what is acceptable. And I think this government is in a very bad situation. It is very heavily captured. And um, how much hope there is for this particular government to actually do something um, in the interest of the British people in this respect is difficult to know. But I think, you know, if we are thinking in five year, 10 year time spans, I think the shift in society, the shift in attitudes that's now going on, which is really quite substantial and particularly among young people, um, we are really going to see the potential opening up for very new kinds of politics and things that were not acceptable and were regarded as radical, crazy, nutcase theories, I think are now um, going to become acceptable and, and hopefully 
many of them will become policy. So as I said, you know, it's not, it's, these are worrying times and, uh, you know, people on the right have a very powerful, um, I, I hesitate to use the term left and right, actually, but pe- people who, the vested interests yeah. um, who are in favor of, of corrupted markets and rigged mon- markets, you know, in their own, int- in their own interests, they, they are very, very powerful. Um, but people on both the right and the left are opposed to rigged markets. They're worried about inequality. They're worried about the environment. Um, and, you know, there's quite a broad coalition, potential coalition building up uh, right across the political spectrum. What, you know, n- apart from the vested interest, pretty much everybody else can get on board with large parts of the agenda of a sort of fairly coherent agenda that's, that's building of sort of economic um, new ways of thinking about how to how to manage the economy and so i think there's you know there's these are very scary times but there's also a lot of opportunity out there a lot to fight for yeah that's definitely something i've been trying to think about um is is sort of figuring out when because you know I've, i've definitely noticed the last sort of five years there's a lot of radical ideas becoming far more accepted like people would just be like yeah no even even like family friend uh, of mine who who would be staunchly conservative was saying, you know, maybe, maybe we need like some sort of investment in the country, you know, maybe, maybe Labour had it, had, had, you know, the, the right idea sort of 2017, 2019, which is just something I could never have imagined him even, you know, conceding. So there's definitely like a, 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 a momentum building towards some kind of radical ideas. And uh, yeah, I hope you're right that, that in the next sort of five to ten years that we can can see some of those ideas sort of put into into practice that, that it won't they will no longer just sort of be um, fringe ideas and, and things that, you know, uh, people are just considered nutcases or loons for trying to imagine something different to what we sort of the, the, the hegemony that we've had for 40 years. Um, but I'm also very aware that, that you have to, to shoot on. Um, is there yeah, a- I, anything you'd like to finish with? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I've been reading a book called How to Fight Inequality by Ben Phillips. It's a really good short book. Um, and uh, it, it really makes the point about, you know, if you, if, if we feel we want to do something about this, there is actually lots we can do as individuals. I think, you know, one thing we really should not put too much energy is becoming, you know, Twitter warriors or Facebook warriors. I think that is a, that is a, that is a dead end that one um and it just sort of you know it is feeding you know what's happening is a, a kind of dis- great distraction going on um there's a there's a, uh, for those, those of you who've seen the film the big short which is about the last global financial crisis yeah there was a section in it where they said um uh you know are they gonna is reform gonna happen and uh the conclusion was no because what they did was they blamed it all on poor people and immigrants and um, moved on and kept doing what they're doing. So if we start being sort of, you know, trying to fight these battles on social media, these things are kind of fanning up hatred and tribal sort of, you know, they're sorting us all into tribes and we're never going to get anywhere with this. What we need to start doing is organizing properly and connecting with people, um, you know, going on protests, contacting your political representatives, um, getting engaged with maybe organizations that are involved in trying to fight a particular aspect of things, getting properly involved in, you know, talking to your friends, just making, you know, acting in some sort of political way. I think we are seeing, a, you know, really powerful movements coming together. And I think there is a lot of, there's just a lot of stuff that ordinary people can do um, to, try and, to try and fight against this stuff. And I think these are, you know, these are interesting times and there's just so much to fight for and the stakes are so high. Well, that seems like a, a very optimistic and, and nice place to leave it. Um, so, Nicholas, I have to say thanks. That was a, a pleasure, real insight, and, and it was great to... Yeah. Um, thank you. Not a problem. Um, it was fantastic to, to read your book. Uh, definitely recommended The Finance Curse to anyone else, and I'll be checking out your um, Tax Havens book next. Actually, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and to our mailing list. And don't forget my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, is now available for pre-order on Amazon. You'll find the link in the description below. Until next time, thanks for listening.